you father out of who you are. Becoming a dad does not magically transform you. It transforms you positionally. It transforms the, the gravity of, of who you are in your life. But you care who you are gets plopped into fatherhood. And you parent out of who you are. You don't just become some superhero in that moment. And as your kids grow, you may come to realize that the habits and examples that you saw are ingrained in you. And it can happen slowly. Um, maybe the temper that you had experienced as a kid, you realize now is your temper. And maybe the impatience and lack of gentleness you realize now you have as well, right? Because kids have a special way of reaching into your baggage and drossing it to the surface. Someone asked me once, he's like, what's fatherhood like? And I said, it's kind of like salt on food. You know, like salt, does, it has a flavor, but it's not like a flavor you just like seek out, like you're just gonna eat salt by itself. The, the purpose of salt, you put it on your food to in- accentuate the flavors that are already existing within that dish. And so kids do that to you as a father. Whatever is in you, they bring out, whether good or bad, to the surface. Um, have you ever had this happen? Like you react poorly to, you react poorly to um, something that your kid is doing, and then their reaction back to you, you kind of see yourself at shoes when you were a kid. One time, you know, Caden was maybe two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Let's just say he was seven, okay? And then we, we moved into the house that we have now. And as we were decorating, we have this, um, you know, you do sand ceremonies. You do sand ceremonies at your wedding. So we had this heart space, and we filled it with the sand from the ceremony, right? And we put it on this shelf that's pretty high and out of the kid's reach. And the reason we did that because it's out of the kid's reach. But as the years went on, we forgot about the fact that they grow. And eventually they'll be able to reach that shelf. And so um, I'm assuming I was grumpy because, (laughs) right? And so um, I asked Caden to put something away. I think it's like the second or third time I'd asked him to do something and he wasn't doing it and frustration increases with, with every ask. So I was like, put it away. You gotta do this other thing that I asked you to do. And so for I don't know what reason other than him being a child, he decides that he's gonna put it away on the highest shelf that he can reach because he's a big boy and he can reach high shelves. I don't know. It just so happened that that was the shelf that our vase was on. And as he put it on, he knocks it off, it comes crashing down, shatters it, and there's sand everywhere. And I flashed him a look, and it, um, I remember the anger that I felt, one, because he wasn't listening, and two, uh, because now he wasn't listening, this accident happened. And I gave him a look, and it thrust him into panic. He looked at me, and he was afraid, and he ran from me. And um, I know sometimes we, we can maybe joke about that stuff a bit, but he was, his relationship with me at that moment was terrified. And he ran from me, and he ran up the stairs to his room, and all through the house, you could hear him wailing and crying and sobbing almost unconsolably. And when that happened, I remember being in his shoes, And I realized that I am doing to him what I said I wouldn't. The expectations that I had when he was born and I said, I'm going to do better, well, the expectations weren't meeting the reality, right? Think about marriage. People get married not thinking that that they're going to have a divorce or an ugly divorce, or, or whatever you want to call it. 
but sometimes we go into these things with these expectations, and it just, for whatever reason, whether it's our behavior or someone else's behavior, it just, it doesn't happen. Caden ran away from me, scared. And, and I was flooded in that moment with memories of that. And I realized that my constant frustration, my constant correcting, my own lack of gentleness um, that had come out of the challenges of parenting, I had given and I had instilled in my son in that moment, I realized a fear of punishment, which is something that I personally wrestle with. And, and I work really hard to navigate life without that fear. And I have to check it and be intentional with it. But I've passed it on to him. And, and I realized that there's an issue here, that I have a problem. You talk about lying in bed with condemnation that night. You know, as a dad, when you go to sleep, and you have, every day you have these intentions, I'm going to do great, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, right? And then something happens, you blow up, everything gets messed up, and then you go to bed. Maybe sometimes, you know, the kids went to bed, and they didn't really want to say goodnight to you. Maybe this is just my experience. But then, you know, um, then you're laying in bed, and you're just thinking, dang, like, what a write-off today, you know, and, and, and you can can start to believe those lies that maybe they're better off without me, because you're categorizing in the position of, you know what, I'm actually, I'm not doing any better, and maybe they'd be better off without me, and you can lie in, at night with this con- condemnation, and, and on top of that, after that, um, I heard a saying that there's two types of dads. There's the one that you run from when you make a mistake, and there's the ones that you run to when you make a mistake. I messed up, don't tell my dad. Or I messed up, like I need, I should t- I need to tell my dad. I need to bring this, I need to bring him into my situation. And the, and the reality in that moment that I was not the latter weighed on me incredibly heavy. And an unfortunate reality is that we are imitators. And the, and the examples that have been set for us or have partially been ingrained in us will dictate sometimes how you father. And this may not be your story, which would be great, but a hurt past can bring her future. It's, you know, how you know how to be. The Bible says in the verse, says, be imitators of God. Well, in order to imitate God, you need to know God. So if you peel that verse back one layer, what it's saying is, get a new example. Even if you had the best dad in the world, doesn't matter, get a new example. Because tell you what, we're all sinners. Every one of us are sinful, well, every one of us fathers are sinful dads, and we had sinful dads before us, and our kids are going to be sinful dads, right? So get a new example. Look to God. The verse says, um, be imitators of God as beloved children. You are a child of God first, right? God is your father. Dads, God is your heavenly, perfect father, You are a loved child of him. But we need to bring ourselves to him with everything that, who we are, with everything that we are, right? You parent out of who you are. You need to bring who you are to God. And you need to, uh, the good and the bad and the hurt. And you need to bring it before him because he is your beloved, good father. And he can give you a new example of what a good father is. As beloved children, who is God as your father? To me, he's a father that forgives me and he doesn't bring up my past unless he's walking me through hurt and to deal with something gently. And he's patient with me as I stubbornly hold back 
as I'm stuck in my ways. And he's gentle with me in that. And he gives me gifts that I don't deserve, that I haven't worked for. The Bible says that every good gift, every good and perfect gift is from above, um, from, from the Father above. And so the good gifts in my life are not purely because of my own doing. The good gifts in my life is Kristen, my wife. Thank you, Jesus. You gave me a gift that I don't deserve. My kids are gifts that I don't deserve that come from God above. Every good gift. We got a new car. My car is a gift from above. Our father is a father who gives gifts based not off of our past poor actions, right? And, you know, and and he's gentle with us. We think about Gideon. And Gideon, his, his, um, his community, his, his country was being taken over, and he went and hid in a wine press. <laughs> He's cowarding. And then an angel from God comes to Gideon, and he addresses him. He says, mighty man of valor. Well, Gideon was not in that moment acting like a mighty man, but what's God doing as a father? He's calling on the potential that he sees. And God is always doing that with us. As my father, God sees my potential, and he brings me along the journey of reaching that in gentleness. I am watched for and cared for. Kristen's grandma always says uh, that she doesn't worry much about her life. I don't know if that's because she's 80, and um, she just has more experience. And she knows it's going to be okay because I worry, I worry a lot. And, uh, and, and she's like, oh, but I'm a king's kid. God's my father. He owns everything. He's always taken care of me my whole life. I am his kid. I don't need to worry. God is a father that we all run to when we mess up. When we, when we mess up and we're hitting our consequences, how many of us cry out to God, Lord, I need, pr- I need prayer. We say to each other, pray for me for this. Pray for me for that. Because we recognize the fatherhood of God is one that we run to. We run to him when we mess up because of his grace and his love for us. The second part of that verse says, and walk in love. As Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, like, what I'm saying is that there may come a time in, in fatherhood, you know, and, and again, some of you guys here, you've got grown kids, and so you know this more than I do, that um, you recognize that you really need that example. You really need a new example in order to keep going. But in order to, to maybe even come close to the father that you expect it to be and that you want to be, you first need to focus on who am I as a child of God? And who am I as his example for that? And you grow closer to God because he takes care of who you are. He's the one that uh, the Bible says searches your heart at night. And he knows you like no one else does. And so as you grow closer to him, you can become a more effective relay for God. Because your kids are also his kids. And the love that he has for them, he has for you. And the more intimate you get to be with God, you, you may come to a head where you're dealing with a situation with your kid and God reminds you, remember how I dealt with you? And it changes in a moment the inclination of your heart. Now what I'm saying is that none of us is going to be a perfect father. We're going we're to mess up all the time. And, um, and we can have grace ourselves with that, but where is our focus? Because that, that, I think that when we say, I am going to do better, I'm going to do better, that's a trap. That's your focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on your own personal ability to be a dad, but that you're supposed to get from God, and your focus needs to shift onto my own personal childhood with God and how he is as my own father, and let him set a new example for me. 
walk in love. When the Bible says to walk in something, it's saying that in every way that you move, love should be coming out. And, and that, that can look differently you know, with every person, but it's the state of your heart. Everything that you do is in love, right? We want to become Christ-like. When Christ was on earth, he walked in love. Absolutely every action that he did came from a place of love. Walk in love in all that you do. <clears throat> when you have intimacy with God, um, and you'll know his heart, and you have a new example. As Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us. You know, you don't want to try to be a good dad. We learned something that says, don't stop trying to do things. Train to do something. Every dad, like if you, if you look at this new perspective of I'm trying to learn from God in, in my own fatherhood experience, I'm a student father. Stop trying to be a good dad. Train for it. Because if you're training for it, then you give yourself more grace. You will falter. You will fail. And, and, um, and your kids have, you know, like, again, my perspective, little kids, right? But your kids have big hearts. They're full of forgiveness. And there's oftentimes that we'll just need to humble ourselves and admit wrongdoing. And that can cover a multitude of wrongness. It says, in walk in love... As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A good father gives himself up for his family. Worship team, I'll call you guys back up. A good father gives himself up for his family because he knows that God and Christ has given himself up for you. You know, when, when, you're, when you're single, you draw a circle around yourself and you take care of everything within that circle. And when you're a dad, you draw a bigger circle around the family. And everybody who's in that circle gets their needs met before you. Christ gave of himself up for the church. And we as fathers need to give of ourselves up for the family. But it takes a lot of strength. And it takes a lot to, to do that to be constantly giving. I remember having conversations with Kristen and saying, I'm just so tired. Like, like and, and my, maybe my heart was in the wrong place, but I'm like, don't I get anything? I'm so tired of giving. There's demand in my life everywhere that I go. You know, everywhere that I go. Demand is, is people want things of me. You come home and, you know, there's a million questions to answer. Right, and then when do I get a break? And it takes a lot of strength to endure that, to endure the amount of giving that fatherhood demands from you. But Hebrews 12, 2 um, says something, it says that God went, for the joy that was set before him, Christ went to the cross. For the joy that was set before him, Christ went to the cross. Here it says that he gave of himself up for the church as we are to give ourselves up for our families, for the joy set before him, Christ gave himself up and endured the cross. There is a joy attached to the amount of giving that you do as a father, but you can't get there on your own because your natural inclination is to say, dang, there's too much demand of me. But God gives you strength and joy. You know, the joy that God was thinking of when he went to the cross is that finally all of his children are going to be able to be in heaven with him. It was a joy for him to sacrifice for his children because of the future that it meant that we would have being in eternity with him, right? There is a joy and a blessing in the giving of yourself.